fall in your arms and lean on you to be our sustainer, our Father and our Savior. May we love you so much and we worship you. Um, wow. That will wake you up. Um, there you go. Uh, so, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 15. That's the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 15. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I love to get recognition from Christy for the things I do around the house. Um, like, I just... I love it. Like, I live on it. I thrive on it. It's like, you know, hey, babe, did you see I put my dish in the dishwasher? Like, <laughs> like that's any big deal. Like, any, like, what are you, two? I mean, that's, that's kind of the look that she gives me sometimes. Like, what, did I give you a cookie now? To which I say, yes, please give me a cookie. I've earned it. Um, but I just love to get that record. And it's, it's just the dumbest things. And I'm always, I always do this. And she'll testify to this. Like, I'm all, like, I'll come home and she hasn't said anything about, you know, whatever it is I cleaned up or the thing that she's been asking me to do for five years that I finally did. It's like, man, I've been asking you to do it for five years and now you want me to like give you a round of applause because you finally done it. And, but I, I do that. I want to earn Christy's favor. It's like, I feel like I always want that. I crave that. And if, if you're in a relationship, maybe you can, maybe you can relate. Maybe you just like that affirmation. Words of affirmation are a real big deal to me. And, and maybe you're the same way. Maybe maybe you do something and if you don't get the quite the jubilee from your partner that you thought you were going to get, you're a little disappointed in it. And I don't do things for Christy just because I get the data boy. Um, I do it because I love her, but the data boy doesn't hurt. Let me just put it that way. So, so but I feel like we're kind of the same way. Like we try to earn God's favor. Um, but here's the problem with us, with all of humanity, is we can't be good enough to earn God's favor. We, we just can't. The Bible teaches us um, that, we, that we cannot. And I mean, you, know, you may ask, well, what about all the obedience that we've talked about for the past few weeks? If you haven't been here, we've been talking about faith. And, and we said that genuine faith always leads to obedience. And so we've talked about that a lot. And it can kind of be confusing uh, if you get those two mixed up, you know, if you think, well, obedience leads to God's favor, maybe leads to faith. No, it's only faith results in obedience, but it's not the other way around. Obedience really doesn't produce anything for us. And some of you may say, well, man, that sounds awful. Why would I want to serve a God that I can't please? I mean, if it's never good enough, why would I do that? And, and it's not that we can never please God. It's that we can never undo the bad that we've already done in our lives. It's not we can't undo the sin that we've done in our lives by trying to do good. In fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds are like rubbish to God because of the extent of our sinfulness. And I would put it this way: um, I, I would never do this. I hope I would never do this. Uh, but it, like, if I cheated on Christy and she found out that I cheated on her, and I said, "Yeah, but look, I emptied the dishwasher for you," she'd be like. I don't care. Like, you cheated on me, right? It's over. It's over. You're going to be emptying the dishwasher by yourself for the rest of your life. That's the way it is. And that's kind of the way it is. We, we cheat on God. And then we say, but look, God, I emptied the dishwasher for you. And he's like, you know, it's just not going to cut it. And so there's nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. But there is one thing that the Bible tells us that actually pleases God, that actually pleases God. We kind of see this in the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. So look in Genesis chapter 15. If you don't have your Bible, it's fine. The words will be on the screen. We're looking at verses 1 through 6. And it says this, After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abraham continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born of my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. 
He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So we see here that Abram is having a conversation with God. You know, one of the things I like about the Bible, we kind of talked about this in neighborhood group a little bit. We see these characters in the Bible, these historical figures, and we do one of two things. We either put them on this huge pedestal and say, oh my goodness, these are these great heroes of the Bible, of the faith. We see these amazing things that they did or that God did through them. I could never be like that. Like I could never be an Abram or I could never be a Paul, an apostle Paul or a Peter or, or, or an Elijah or any of these people. I can't be a Moses. We either do that or we do the other extreme. We look at the Bible and we see the mistakes that they've made and we sit there and we judge them. Because we got the advantage of hindsight. We see, well, can't they see what God was doing? Can't they see how great God is? And God's done all this stuff for them, and now they lose faith or whatever. So it's, it's one or the other. But here, this is one of the things I love about the Bible. Is the Bible just presents people as they really are. As they are. The good, the bad, and everything in between. You know, it's, it's one of the things that I believe validates the authenticity of the Bible. You know, most works of antiquity, they... You know, they kind of gloss over the bad parts for the heroines of the story and the heroes of the story, and they only show the good parts, but not the Bible. It shows all the ugly blemishes, too. And so here we see that Abram is a normal person just like you and me. He's just a normal guy. He has questions. He's confused. And he comes to God, and he wants answers. In fact, one thing I think it's important for us to realize about faith is faith doesn't mean that we're not asking questions. A lot of times we think, man, if I really had faith, I wouldn't question God. If I really had faith, you know, this would just be super easy. But that's just not true. That's a lie. And I think a lot of times we believe that lie, and then when we struggle, we get down on ourselves. We start to feel guilty. We start to feel full of shame. And then it just perpetuates. The more we believe that lie, the more we feel guilty, the more questions we have. And then we start doubting our faith. And we start doubting God. So faith doesn't mean not asking questions, but faith does mean believing no matter what the answer might be. And so we see Abraham, he has questions. God came to Abraham and he told him, he said, look, don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your reward will be very great. And it's like Abraham didn't have any problem believing that he didn't have to be afraid. You know, what just happened, uh, we kind of skipped over this part, is as Abram's nephew Lot got captured and taken away. And Abram got a bunch of his men and went and kicked some butt like the Eagles going to do today. And, uh, yeah, there you go. And, uh, and, and he, he rescued his nephew Lot. And, and so God said, hey, look, you don't have to worry about these other people. I'm going show Abram didn't have a problem with that. It was the promise that the reward would be very great. Abram just didn't see it. He just didn't understand it. And so he was wrestling with God's promises. And it's okay if we wrestle with God's promises. It's okay. Abram said, hey, I can't understand this. How is this all going to work? Right now, my only choice is to adopt one of my servants. That, that's the only way I see this working out. And that's what he's talking about doing with this Eleazar of Damascus. He said, hey, look, I don't have a kid. You, God, have not given me offspring. You said you would. You haven't. So the only way I can figure out that this is going to work is if I adopt Eleazar, my servant, and I'll make him my heir. Abram could have easily said, you know what, God, look, I've given up everything. I left everything. I've been wandering around living in tents. You owe me. He could have said that. I think that a lot of times that's what we do. Like when we try to earn God's favor, we say, man, God, I've done this. I've done that. I've been obedient here. I'm not like these other people. And you owe me, God. You just owe me. But he didn't. He didn't say that. He just simply came and asked God, how is this going to work? And then in verse 6, it says, Abram believed the Lord. In other words, when God gave him an answer, he believed it. He believed it. There's, there's a story in this little town out in the Midwest that was experiencing a horrible drought. Like It hadn't rained in two years. And as an agricultural community, all the farmers, they their crops were dying, and they, they just weren't doing well at all. So the whole town got together, and they decided they were going to pray for God to, to send rain. And so they came, and, and people brought their rosaries. 
And other people came and they brought their cross. And other people uh, came and they brought their Bibles. And they had all these symbols. And they were dressed in their Sunday best. And the priests were wearing their robes, the, the local Catholic priests. And the pastors were wearing their suits from the Protestant churches. And they all came and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And they asked God to give rain. And they really thought it was going to happen because they had their rosaries and they had their cross and, and they had their Bibles. But in the end, nothing happened. Like, the day came and went and there was no rain. And, and then the next day, this little boy, he came to this town square all by himself. And he prayed and he asked God to bring the rain. And after he asked God to bring the rain, he had the umbrella that he brought with him and opened up the umbrella. And what happened? The skies began to darken, thunder started to rumble, and rain started to fall. Now, what's the difference? Everyone, everyone else that came brought symbols, and they thought, man, if I just have this symbol, if I trust in this symbol, it's going to do something. They didn't really necessarily believe it was going to rain. They believed in the symbols. This little boy brought the umbrella because he had faith. He believed that God was going to answer his prayers and do something. You know, it's kind of interesting. With the Eagles in the Super Bowl, there's lots of superstitions going around right now. I was, uh, I was in the coffee shop earlier this week, and I was sitting there. And this guy walks in, I'm doing some work, and he, he really loudly says, I came in here the Friday before the NFC Championship game and got a drink, and we won the game. So I figured I had to come in Friday before the Super Bowl so we could win the Super Bowl, right? And this is not uncommon. Like, I seriously, honestly, the first time I got my Carson Wentz jersey on, the first time I wore the Wentz jersey was the game that Carson Wentz got injured. And so I seriously thought in my head, Maybe I shouldn't wear that jersey anymore. Is anyone else a superstitious sports fan like that? Like, no, so it's half of you are, half of you are. Like, I, I kind of get that way. We feel like there's things that we can do that can bring about certain changes. You know, it's superstitious to go get coffee at the same coffee shop every Friday before the game because you think your team's going to win. What faith is, is putting your chair on Broad Street today to get ready for the Super Bowl parade on Tuesday. You understand the difference? Like, that's the difference between being superstitious and having faith or, or just believing intellectually and having faith. Paul addresses the idea of, of faith and not works for, for us. In, in Romans chapter 4, it says this. He's actually talking about Abraham in Romans 4, uh, verse 1. It says, What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares the ungodly to be righteousness, his faith is credited for righteousness. What does God do? By his grace, he revealed a little more of the plan and reassured Abram. And Abram, though he was going to have to, thought, Abram thought he was going to have to adopt a servant, but God says, no, you will have your own son. And he takes him out and he shows him the stars. He shows him the stars. That's what I want to talk about. Look, we're settling for things in life when God wants to give us the stars. We're settling for trying to do things on our own, on our own way. When God says, hey, look, I got so much more for you. My plan is so much bigger than what you're trying to do on your own. And we're trying to settle. Abram was settling for adopting a servant when God wanted to give him his own son. He was settling for a second-rate plan when God wanted to give him the stars. And in our lives, we are all the time settling for second-rate plans. When God wants to give us the stars. You know, the Eagles, uh, one of the stories about the Eagles this year, talking about our, our, our city's team and the Super Bowl, is that they are a team of faith. Many of the players have a strong faith in the God of the Bible. And this has been well documented. But I just want to point out a few things to you. Zach Ertz, who's our tight end. Is he up there? No? There he goes. There, there's Zach. He said this this week during one of the media news days at, at the Super Bowl at the Mall of America in Minneapolis. He said, the most important thing in life is making disciples. Talking about making disciples 
of Jesus Christ. Trey Burton, our, one of our other tight ends, said this. This is a tweet that he put out. He um, said, if you obey for 1,000 years, you're no more accepted than when you first believed. Your acceptance is based on Christ's righteousness, not yours. And then uh, who we got next? Uh, Steph Wisniewski, one of our offensive guards, said this. A lot of, this is last night. A lot of guys will get stressed before the big game. I will focus on the truths like these for Romans 8, 31 through 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And finally, Jordan Matthews, who's our former wide receiver, said this about our quarterback, Nick Foles. He said, I remember going to my first Bible study as an eagle and realizing it wasn't led by a team chaplain. It was led by the starting quarterback. Nick Foles is a true servant, and his impact will transcend anything he does on the field. Why do I bring this up? Is it just to bring praise to these guys and just say, oh, we're going to win because they believe in God? No, I don't, I don't believe that we're going to win because they believe in God. I, I don't think that that necessarily matters because, you know what, there's Christians on the Patriots too. There's guys who believe in God on the Patriots too, and that's not going to mean that they win or that they lose. My point is this. For each and every one of these guys, they're at the pinnacle of their career, at the pinnacle of their profession. They are playing for the Super Bowl, one of the biggest events on the planet, literally one of the biggest events on the planet in modern history. They're there. They won that Super Bowl, and literally they are set for life because no matter where they go, they're introduced as Super Bowl champion dot, 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 list their name. They get speaking engagements, fees. They can have advertisements, you know, do, do promotions and stuff like that. They are set for life. They're already playing in the NFL. These guys have good contracts. They're rich beyond anything that I'll imagine being. But they said, hey, you know what? It's not the pressure of the Super Bowl that matters. Trey Burton said, it's not that that matters. It's, it's not what I do. It's Christ's righteousness that matters. Steph Wisniewski said, hey, it's not the pressure that matters. That's, that's settling for something. There's something bigger than the pressure that I'm feeling right now. It's a fact that no matter what, God loves me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Zach Gertz says, hey, the most important thing in life isn't making the Super Bowl. It isn't winning the Super Bowl. Can you imagine? I mean, this city the past two weeks has been unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. The hope in this city, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can taste it. Everyone you talk to has hope. Everyone thinks that the Eagles are going to win. There's people who have been waiting for generations in their family. This is like, I was telling Christy, this is like Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter, I had a love child, and it's the Super Bowl for the Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. Like, it's that precious and that important for families in our city. I've already literally talked to people and see them tear up as they're talking about the idea of the Eagles actually winning a Super Bowl. There's 6 million people, over 6 million people in the Philadelphia metro area. 46 million within the 200 mile radius. You think Zach Ertz has the hopes and dreams of an entire city, over 6 million people, riding on him. And he has the chance to fulfill that today if he wins the Super Bowl. He has the chance to fulfill it. But what does he say? He doesn't say that's the most important thing. He said that would be settling for something completely inferior to making disciples for Jesus Christ. That's what I mean when I say don't settle when God offers the stars. He wants so much more than what we see right in front of us in this life. Romans chapter 4, verses 20 through 25 says this. He does not waver in unbelief, talking about Abraham, at God's promise but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him, talking about Abraham, for righteousness. Now it was credited to him, now it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us, meaning you and me. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses, and raised for our justification. So why do we settle for being a good person or a better person on our own when by faith God wants to make you a righteous person? He wants to make you righteous, completely 
right before Him. We want to try to live good lives on earth. Well, God wants to give us a lifetime acquittal for our sins. That's what that word justification means. Jesus died, who is delivered for our trespasses. In other words, He died to pay the penalty for the sins that you and I have committed. And He was raised to justify us. In other words, give us a lifetime acquittal. We're no longer guilty. But we stand innocent before the God of all creation. There is nothing better than that. There is nothing greater than that. And if we're not living in that reality and in that truth, then we're just settling for something small, something that we can produce on our own. When God says, no, I got something so much bigger, so much better for you, something that you can't possibly do. In fact, Faith isn't faith at all if it's something that we can do on our own. Faith isn't faith at all if it's something that we can figure out and try to make happen. Faith is only faith if it requires God intervention to make it happen. And the fact of the matter is, we are not saved by our works. We're not saved by something we can do. We're only saved by believing in God. By having faith in God. It wasn't that Abraham left his home, left his family, left everything and wandered around in the wilderness because God told him to. It's that he believed. What did God say? And he believed, and God credited it to him as righteousness. What do you believe? Are you settling for something less than what God has for you? Are you settling for something less than the promises that God has in his word? I'm going to ask Toria and Ellie, you can come back up. Are you settling for something less? Don't do that. God wants to give you the stars. He wants to show you his majesty. He wants you to experience him in the way that you can't experience him unless you have faith. Don't settle for less. Let's pray. God, we love you so, so much. And we thank you. We thank you for examples of faith. Or just a normal guy, Abraham, is normal like me, normal like everyone in this room. And he had questions that he wanted answers to. He didn't understand what was going on. He didn't, couldn't figure it out in his head. He couldn't do it on his own. He knew that. He knew he had to rely on you. And God, you gave him a promise, and he believed that promise. And you saved him because of that belief. You credited to him as righteousness. God, help us to believe. Strengthen my faith and forgive my unbelief. God, God, help us not settle for just what we can see and what we can figure out on our own. Help us not settle for what we can do when you have promised us the stars. God, when you, your son Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. God, I want that full life and I know that only comes from faith in you. So God, I pray that you strengthen our faith today. If we've never made that decision to really trust you, to trust Jesus Christ what he did on the cross of the Lord and Savior, and to believe that we can be forgiven for our sins for all eternity because he was raised from the dead, I pray that if someone's in the room here that hasn't done that, that you do that today. God, help us not lean not lean on our own, lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you so that you can direct our paths. God, help us to fully and wholly trust you. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to be right with you. We accept that. We accept salvation. We accept what Jesus Christ did. And we praise you for it. Praise things in Jesus' name.